I'm Tabitha Jackson. I'm the uh, director of the documentary film program at Sundance Institute. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here uh, amongst you all. And um, we love coming here and, you know, the, the uh, session yesterday, the first session on democracy and engagement was unbelievably thrilling. The clarity of thought, um, the takeaways for action, the depth of expertise. I'm not going to promise you any of that today. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to consider with us um, what is co-creation? Why is this term so zeitgeisty at the moment? Why do we need it? And to help me do that are this incredible array um, of friends, collaborators, people who are thinking deeply about this, who are engaged in it, and people who perhaps don't necessarily accept that co-creation is the answer uh, to whatever it is that ails us. So. There are some things that we believe that, uh, that informed why we want to do this session. Firstly, at the Sundance Institute, we believe in story, we believe in storytelling, storytellers most importantly, um, and the importance of the independent voice in culture. We know that storytelling is a transmission system for values that it's the most effective delivery system for an idea. And so the phrase, the power of story, which has been used and commodified and its meaning has been lost to some extent, um, the phrase is correct, but the power isn't necessarily a benevolent one, depending on how you exercise it. Think about the story we tell of the United States, the most popular um, an enduring form of that story, you could argue, is the Western film in Hollywood. It's how many of us grew up encountering uh, what were then called Red Indians, which we now know as indigenous and native people. The Western form was a transmission of a value system. It was about rugged individualism, manifest destiny, and American exceptionalism. That was a story that a nation was telling itself to the exclusion of its founding peoples and without their cooperation, but it, it has shaped the way that we in the world have seen them for almost a century. So story is important. The creation of story is important and how those stories are created is important. Who gets to own them? who gets to deploy them, who gets to create them. So that's why we're talking about this today. Um, I always come armed with quotes. I have no original thoughts. Um, so I'll be stealing quotes from our panelists as the, as the morning goes on. Um, but I have a couple. Um, I'm going to sit down so I can, so I can find them properly. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple that kind of are informing the way I'm Thinking about this, Gloria Steinem said, one of the simplest paths to deep change is for the less powerful to speak as much as they listen and for the more powerful to listen as much as they speak. Wendell Berry, the great writer, poet and thinker, and this for me is the metaphor about this, uh, for this. He says that the limits of a camera is that it's always looking in one direction and always looking through a frame to determine where to set the lens where it's going to look from requires imagination so the great photographers are the ones who knew where to look from not necessarily what to look at and i think there's a vital part of co-creation where are we looking from that's going to inform precisely what we see so Let's get this show on the road. I'm going to invite up um, a couple of people who have been thinking about co-creation in different ways and collaboration. Um, and so let's try in this first slice of what will be uh, a four-slice quiche 
uh, we'll be uh, interrogating, discussing what is co-creation and why do we need it now. So will you welcome Kat Zizek, who you just heard, and Fred Dust. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. That was a very lovely reading. Oh, thank you. There are two things I love about that. One is just starting a, starting a panel by being the lights coming down and a, and a live collective experience of listening. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing I love about it is that the mention of actually the Romans uh, graffiti saying, I am here. It's just so, it makes me think of those ancient, ancient hand prints on walls of caves that date back tens of thousands of years that are, seem to be saying the same thing, but you never see them singly or even in pairs. There are always many of them. So it feels like humanity has been saying to itself ever since we could, we are here. We are here. So Kat, tell me about yourself. What brings you to thinking about co-creation? I'm a documentarian, and I've worked for 20 years um, in documentary, I think pretty much in co-creative models without necessarily calling it that for 20 years. And um, I worked uh, on very large, long projects with many different kinds of partners, with citizens, with organizations, government, nonprofits, um, architects, urban planners. Um, and I was really privileged at the National Film Board of Canada to explore those relationships in really profound and deep ways. And recently, I was invited to come to MIT Open Documentary Lab to start a new studio called Co-Creation Studio. And there, we now have been tasked with um, doing research on what co-creation means. So I've had the distinct honor of interviewing over 50 people now um, about co-creation and how people co-create, not just in documentary, but also journalism and other fields like architecture, again, urban planning, um, industrial design. And people call it many different things. It's almost like that elephant, you know, and it's just trying to find um, what is it, this shape that we're all trying to come closer to? How do we step closer in? How do we lean in to often the discomfort of deep collaboration? And um, it's, it's, been, it's been a really incredible journey. We'll be, we'll be um, publishing a report uh, in, in the fall with the results of that survey. From the MIT co-creation studio. Yeah. Why, so, but what brought you personally, why are you interested in co-creation? Often when we think of the arts, we think of the author or the director or the composer. Um, why co-creation? as you coming from the arts, what, what personally drew you to it, do you think? Um, I, th I think because none of those roles really ever fit me very well. I don't feel comfortable in the roles that have been created before. I'm really interested in moving into spaces where we don't have cookie cutter formula solutions. And so um, I, 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 f I feel like working with people and not knowing the answers, and it's very improvisational. It's, it's really about um, finding that space between us where, it, where we haven't walked before. Um, I, I think one, of, one thing that really comes to mind is I, one of the first people I interviewed is Kamal Sinclair, who's at Sundance. And she, um, she's now working in New Frontier, so in New Technologies, but she had a history in theater and performance and dance. And she was part of an African-American troupe that went to the Gambia for a month when, in 1999. Um, and she was doing workshops with youth, a lot of refugees Sierra, from Sierra Leone. And she said they kept trying to do workshops and they would have a set and a concept and then they would draw a line in the sand. And this was the stage, and this was where the audience was supposed to sit. And she said over and over again, as soon as the action started, like the kids would just cross the line, <laughs> and there was just no line in the sand to be had. It just it wasn't it wasn't the concept that they agreed with. They just wanted to step into the action. And I think that's the impulse I certainly have is just have everybody come in. And uh, Fred, coming to you, just tell us what you do and what and why. You are interested in this in this realm. By the way, no no one at Audio likes to explain what they do. Like my mom <laughs> still hates me. She's like she's like it's it's funny when she has to explain to me. She's like, he's you know and it just stops. But um you know so I, I would say our work at Audio is to kind of put design products strategies stories into the world and and to be frank and I'm gonna feel really pragmatic in in this context um. 
uh, what we've found is that if you just put things into the world that you've made for somebody, it's more than likely they don't like it and they don't like you for doing it. Um, and so the, re the reality is, is that it's really different if you make it with them, um, if, if you, if you co-create. And that's actually the same if we're doing work in the private sector for, for clients or in the social sector when we do work with our nonprofit. When we work with the people we're making something for, it's way better. And I think about it this way. I mean, I, I was thinking this morning, which is that if, if I told you guys that I, like, I'm going to tell you a story about myself, I'm, I, I made a movie about myself, you'd be like, great, you know, maybe I want to watch it. Most likely you wouldn't. But, it's like, but, but, but you, you probably wouldn't be mad at me for like, making the story. If I told you I just made a story about you and I'm going to show it to you, and, and you're like, great, you know, it's like you'd probably be pretty furious. So it's like the reality is like, it's just not fair, I think, to, for, for us to kind of own the manufacture of story. And the last thing, and that's why I love the point, the, the, the film, is that it's like I suspect in the work that I've been doing on designing dialogue is that I'm, We've mostly been co-creating and in dialogue with each other for most of our history, not so much in the modern era. And so I think the notion that this is actually new, I think, is, is a lot in response to what we've actually been experiencing in the terms of authorial voice or the way we think about things now. And I think that's a really key point. So you made the point about equity, cat, which I think is, is vital, and the sense that this isn't new. There is a reason why we presumably come back to it, and I think perhaps... You know, in our work at Sundance Working, particularly in documentary, um, there is a sense and a danger and plenty of examples where our well-intentioned endeavors to tell stories about the world and make sense of the world has actually turned into an extractive industry. Mm -hmm. And so storytellers are going in to communities from the outside, you know, even the phrase, taking pictures, they're taking pictures, they're extracting the stories, um, again, all with the best intent, usually, um, and then bringing the stories out, not leaving anything in the community, and failing to understand certain vital things about what they're looking at. Um, not unlike, do you I think, guess it was the 70s when anthropology went through this phase of, of being kind of extractive. There, is what, there are worries that we are doing the same thing now, I think. And so we're trying to find a different way of, a different way of working. Absolutely. This is very much about decolonization, about stripping away uh, the co colonial aspects of storytelling. I think it's very much about narrative sovereignty, about honoring the people who own the stories, mm -hmm. and not just handing over a mic, but really creating new systems and new ways of lifting up that sovereignty. And, and I honestly think, really, this has been here for a long time. So I'll just give you two historical examples. So I've recently, because we do in-person research, I've been doing a lot of work um, going to Quaker meeting houses, um, which are fascinating processes because basically Quakers sort of like believe that decisions will come out of the silence of, of listening. Um, and it's, it's a collective process. It's basically, so it's not exactly um, storytelling, but it is an act of co-creation. And we were talking about yesterday about being in New Zealand and looking at, this is my favorite story, like the Smithsonian there is called Te Papa, um, which comes from the Maori phrase, and it, what it means is our place. Um, and I, I was suddenly thinking like, what happens when you take a museum, you know, and, and took the Smithsonian suddenly and said, oh no, this is our place. What kinds of things can happen in that space? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's around us. Um, and it, I think it's just, we're rediscovering it in a sense. And I think by having these, uh, alluding to these other examples or learning from these other examples is absolutely vital. And it's, it's, not, it's not lost on me that this, um, that this conversation about are we working with or are we working for is precisely the conversation that you as a social entrepreneur community are having. And there are people, I mean, all of you are thinking about it, I, I assume, um, but people like Partners in Health working with the government of Rwanda, uh, Proximity Designs and Rural Farmers, uh, Selco, congratulations, Selco, uh, working with the rural poor, you know, Crisis Action with a different model, and Slum Dwellers International, who we will um, hear about and from a bit later. But what, what, can we, what can we learn? What are the most interesting models of, of co-creation? And have we actually defined our terms yet? What do you mean by it? You've got a studio that's called it. What do you mean, Kat? What is co-creation? It's a set of models. Um, and, and it can be, again, with participants, the way organizations work with each other. And increasingly, I think artists and um, 
documentarians, journalists are thinking about artificial intelligence. How do we co-create with these large systems that are much bigger than ourselves? Um, even journalists, like journalists five years ago would not want to use the term collaboration. Now we're seeing these incredible collaborations across new newsrooms taking massive sets of data, WikiLeaks, and, and breaking them down together. There's no way that one journalist, one newsroom could do that. We've got to, we've got to start expanding our, our roles. And I think just one example of, um, you can co-create just down the hall here, there's a great example of a project called New Dimensions in Testimony. And you can sit down in a couch and there's a, life, there's a big screen and there's a life-size uh, person sitting there looking at you, at wherever you are in the room, they, they sort of stare at you. And um, you can interact with hundreds of hours of pre-recorded interview with this person. It's a Holocaust survivor. And um, it is, it's fascinating to think about how, I, I asked the, the executive producer yesterday, I did a little interview with him, um, is, did he co-create, did this survivor co-create this project with you? And he said, absolutely. From the beginning, we designed this together. He was on our advisory board. He helped figure out the ethics of this. He helped figure out what questions to ask. One of the questions that I asked him was, how do you feel about being in this project? There was an answer, and he gave such a beautiful answer. And the executive producer said, nobody's ever asked that before, but it's in the system, ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, so there's these new ways, and that's not just with him, it's also with AI. There's uh, artificial intelligence being used in, in natural language processing, all sorts of systems that are in place to allow future generations to have a conversation with uh, with this survivor. So, what do you think? So what do you think co-creation is, Fred? Uh, so you know, it's funny. I was saying to you earlier that like when we brought this up, I was like, there's a, an immediate visceral reaction, which is like, I don't co-create. You know, it's like it's like most because you don't you don't want to have the label of it. And, I'm, and, and last two days, I've been like, oh, we co-create. I'm fine with it. You know, that's that's what it is. Um, but I, just to, just to pause you that why do you why do you think there is a resistance to to the I, I think because we're really stuck on the idea. I mean, as a designer coming, um, I was an artist and then um, architect, like you start by being like, I want to make things. This is me. It's me expressing. And so I think it's actually something kind of innate. And, you know, that handprint is like I am here. And I, and I think what your point is that we have to get to the we are here and we are here together. And I guess I would say that I just want to, like, I think there are principles and rules for co-creation. And two that I'll just hit. Like, we, we have a set idea. We've got, like, 15, you know, whatever. But it's like, but um, two, one is that, that if anyone went to the creative tension sessions, I can't see you. So I'm like, if anyone's out there. But it's like, it's like <laughs> if anyone to the creative tension sessions that we did yesterday and we're going to do today, one of the things we believe in co-creation is that you live in tension, that you actually don't live with the notion that there's a single right answer, that we have to live with the idea that there are multiple. And as long as we talk about that, that's OK. That, that, that it's like tensions are important. And then the other one that's really basic is, um, I always say this to our designers, which is like learn to talk normal, um, which seems easy, but it's not. Like we as designers, we as filmmakers, we as other, other kinds of practitioners, we learn special language. And that's actually can be highly exclusive um, language. And so learning to just talk normal um, is, is really foundational to actually being a co-creative um, kind of body um, and, and actor. So those are two things that we think about. Did you at IDEO co-create those rules, or did someone write them down? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get into that. But yeah, I mean, I would say I would say they're emergent. I mean, you know, we talk of oh, ourselves as an emergent organization. Yeah, and but you just said talk normally. <laughs> Emergence. No, it's, no, it's like, we, we, okay. We we think it bubbles up, right? right and then right. we basically say, oh, that's important, and and we and we grab that. And so I think these things have kind of uh, and who's the we that. that grabs it? We as a collective, and I mean, I will say that when it starts to say, when we start to say, oh, these things feel natural to us, it actually, it's, it's almost like no one's expressing it. It just kind of happens across the system. Because this is, I'm being facetious, but not <laughs> I got entirely <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> facetious, because I think that one of the, particularly as we think about artistic creation, or when you think about the work that you do as social entrepreneurs, you've got to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And so this, this process of um, collective, thinking is it is it a process of collective deciding i mean the bubbling up sounds really lovely but against a, a clock and with a deliverable how do you what is the process to to get to that and cat presumably that's some of the stuff that you're looking at not just wouldn't it be lovely if this thing came to be but like how does it practically work yeah it's definitely a living process so a lot of people will talk about 
being more co-creative at the beginning of a project, and then as things narrow down, it becomes, you know, in some ways people fall into roles and, and, and the team maybe gets smaller and things get done. So it's not, it's not like static, like we are co-creating all the time, but it's tools and ways in which we can just bring more voices and more decision making into, into the process along the way. And then where do you see, you know, where does that process stop? What, what are the ethics around it? So, so creation is one thing, let's create this together. If there is money that's either going into it or coming out of it, how, does, how do those resources flow? Are there other ethical issues um, and practical logistical issues you see around co-creation that we should be considering? Oh, huge amounts. Huge amounts of um, decision, like you said, the decision making, the money, um, the time, uh, who, even just asking people to come into a process like that can be really hard for people that, for example, have two jobs, live in a high rise. I worked with in high rise with high rise residents for a long time, and people have two, sh you know, working two shifts. How do you get them to work in a co-creative process that can take a long time? And those are the kinds of things that need to be discussed up front. So it's a lot more about um, negotiating and figuring those things out together. And there isn't one formula, but I think what we're hoping to do at the co-creation studio is to create more models, to create space for sharing these, these ways in which people do things. It's a lot of the stuff that happens in the margins. Yeah. You know, that's what I hear a lot, that people say, this is not the stuff that we ever document or that we ever even have time to, uh, to share with our audiences sometimes. So you can look at work and not know it's co-created. But uh, it's 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 for us it's it's time to 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 shed a light on that. Can I can I build on that? Because I, I actually would say that um, I don't think we have to think of co-creation as being always the entire thing. I think the notion is that there should be moments as we're making things that are co-creative. Um, and and I, I really go back to I mean you were saying you work in you work with high-rise you know dwellers and it's a classic example, like you'll pull a town hall together to talk about something. And it's a it's a if you've ever been to a town hall to talk about a new building or a new um, um, no one's listening. Everyone's waiting to talk, right? So it's like, I mean, and, and the best signal that someone's waiting to talk is that their hand's up because they're like, the moment your hand goes up, you're like, adrenaline's going through your system. So you're basically like, I'm not listening to anything else in the room. And so it's like, so the reality is like, you need new tools to be able to have that dialogue. Um, and those, 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 and that allows for co-creation. It allows for a gathering, a listening, and an engagement in a different way. And so. I wouldn't say it's always all the process, but it has, from a design perspective, it has to be built into the process at multiple points, um, mm. I believe, at least, so. And Kat, are you thinking of this, I mean, you, you are investigating it, you're not prescribing it, but do, is it a model that you would like to see replacing some of the um, existing sole authorship, sole authorship models, or is it something that can go alongside them? I think there's many different ways to make work um, as new technologies emerge, they don't knock out the old ones. I mean, I think we see resurgence of radio, for example. You know, radio is an older media form, but somehow the internet and our new technologies, our cell phones, our podcasts, allow for the radio form, the audio uh, art, to come rise back up. So it's, it's really just adding to the toolkit. I think that's a great, I mean, so I'm a little obsessed with radio and, and audio in general, and I think that the notion that that is a form of co-creation because it actually relies on imagination from the listener to actually kind of add in to the, to the story. And so I think it's interesting that we've seen the kind of resurgence of that medium at a moment where there's a lot of other mediums that actually leave very little to the amount, like we wish we had more to imagine. You know, so I think, I think we're seeing interesting reactive moments on in mediums. I still think it's, it's, um, it's, the lines are very blurry still for me between co-creation, collaboration, participation. And um, I think as we go through this session, um, it'd be interesting to see what, what comes out. And then I want to bring you both uh, back up with everybody to have a, a discussion. Um, Kat, I know um, you have begun to draft some principles around some of your thinking around co-creation. Jamie, I don't know if you can pull up the slide, the 10 draft principles. Oh, look at that. Jamie, you're on it. Um, so, uh, are there any of those that you want to pull out for us? Um, uh, I'm 48, so I can't actually read that font. <laughs> okay, nor can uh, you. So but I'll, I'll, I, I will just add, because maybe we haven't talked very much about what happens when work goes out into the world. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, I think we're very interested in projects that 
uh, relate to the wor world in terms of trying to be part of a larger strategy to change the world. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing I just want to talk about in terms of the Me Too movement, which I think is a really interesting um, harnessing of, of, uh, of, of social media in a really co-creative way, um, we, we live in an unprecedented time of disclosure of trauma. I, I, we've never had a time where we've We've had so many people talk about their trauma. And yet, I think we have not figured out how to think about trauma in a collective way. We still think of it as an individualized, like you just deal with the psychology of one person. And, and for me, very much storytelling, um, especially collective storytelling, is about thinking about trauma and healing in, in much larger mm. collective ways. Mm. Well, this is, uh, this is the beginning of the conversation. I'm gonna take your first point make media with people and within communities rather than for or about them. And your second principle, focus on process rather than just product, as a beautiful segue into our second chapter of conversation. So thank you very much, and then I'll see you in a minute. <laughs>